With its great design, ease of use, and worldwide adaptability, WhatsApp has become the world's largest messaging app, with over 2 billion people using it every single day to talk to their friends, family, and co-workers. But unlike its competitors, they don't run ads, they don't charge for their service, and they don't sell your data. So how on earth are they paying for the billions of messages sent every day? How can they afford to be the giant that they are? Well, to answer the question of how WhatsApp makes its money, we need to understand why the founders ever built WhatsApp in the first place. You see, WhatsApp's founders, Brian Acton and Han Kuhn, weren't what you'd expect from Silicon Valley type people. They didn't come from vast riches and they were in their 30s before they even thought of WhatsApp. In the meantime, they were bouncing around Silicon Valley just looking for any stable job. Because during the 2000s, the pair had left their jobs at Yahoo after disagreeing with the company's lack of ideals. Both Brian and Jan were deeply principled people and their hopes of securing a position at Facebook fell flat when the company rejected their applications. However, after realizing that Facebook lacked any principles either, they decided to make their own app. Because at the time, Brian and Jan had both seen the massive success of the new iPhone in 2008 and the potential of its brand new app store. And so trying to take advantage of this fact, they both set out to make their own app. But their first attempts were failures. The app was unstable and drained the battery of any phone using it. Jan nearly quit altogether, but only stayed when Brian talked him into it, telling him that over time this would all be worth it. And Brian was right, because it wouldn't take long for the foundations of WhatsApp to finally come together. The core principles of the app was simple. At first, the app was created to let users update their status and send a notification to friends with the message. But when they started experimenting the app on test groups, they found that people started using the system to chat with one another by updating their status. Noticing this unintended usage, Jan and Brian pounced on the opportunity, completely changing WhatsApp into a simple messaging service instead. And what made WhatsApp so different, and what's so important about the founders, was that they were different to everyone else in Silicon Valley, with their app being so unique because it was based on the founders' ideals. All of the traditional ways apps make money just looked wrong to them. Advertising was too annoying for users and polluted the app, charging for the service would probably kill the app, and selling user data was just shady and dishonest. But this wasn't detrimental to WhatsApp, in fact it only made it more popular. People loved WhatsApp as a free, easy to use and uncluttered alternative to texting. And to make it just that much easier to use, WhatsApp became integrated with your phone number. The timing, the framework, and the founders' ideals allowed WhatsApp to grow exponentially. It took just a few months after launching for over 250,000 people to join the app. This kind of fast growth at the time was unprecedented. WhatsApp was taking over the app store by storm, with the app catching the eyes of some of Silicon Valley's biggest investors. In fact, Jan and Brian's old contacts at Yahoo had heard about the waves the app was making, and so together the pair organized a $250,000 initial investment. But after the investment, the founders did something different. They didn't reinvest the money to try and accelerate WhatsApp's growth, a strategy that's used by almost everyone else in Silicon Valley. Instead, they went against all business practices and actually saved this money, because they had figured out the solution to how WhatsApp was going to make money. And in the beginning, it was all about investors. Investors gave WhatsApp just enough to keep the servers running. Jan and Brian would then cut down the company costs, having a skeleton crew and looking to cut any expenses wherever possible. And in return, this meant that they didn't have to sell the app sole. And this became a self-perpetuating cycle. As more people joined the app, it attracted more investors. And with their money, WhatsApp could grow to accommodate and attract more users. It could spend more on being completely user-friendly, thus growing the app's user base even more, and then attracting more investors and so on. And this noble effect propelled WhatsApp to the top of Silicon Valley, all while allowing WhatsApp to stay out of free without costing its users a penny. And their unique plan to grow the app was working. The figures for the app over the next few years would show the founders had done something incredible. They didn't sell data, they didn't sell ads, and whilst they did implement a small fee of $1 for the app, in most cases this was just totally voluntary. It acted more like a Wikipedia donation than a paid app. And yet even with this, WhatsApp was becoming a billion dollar company. Which is why as WhatsApp gained traction, more and more people in the tech world realized its full potential. Because they saw that the users they were pulling in were right for data farming. And given WhatsApp already integrated people's phone numbers, this made it even easier. And that's why just within a year of founding the company, the founders were bombarded with requests to buy the app. By 2010, Google had made multiple requests to buy the app, along with other prominent tech companies. However, the founders knew their potential better than anyone, and they were going to stick to their principles by declining all the offers to buy the company outright. The only thing they would accept were more offers for investment. And by early 2011, WhatsApp received $8 million in funding for just 15% of the company, despite the fact that the app still wasn't making any real money. But this continual reinvestment allowed for WhatsApp to continue growing. Two years after the $8 million investment, WhatsApp had spread to over 200 million people worldwide. 
And to supplement this growth, the company gained another $50 million in investment, meaning that WhatsApp was now worth $1.5 billion. So to put this into perspective, in just a few short years, Yan and Brian had grown their idea into a billion dollar company. Even though they'd barely made any money, the only value that WhatsApp had was the massive amount of users on the app and leveraging these users to secure investments. But unfortunately for the founders, this system wasn't gonna work forever. Eventually they would need to make money or the investors would all eventually pull away. And so they had to find a way to monetize the app without violating their core ideals and values. And then one day at the WhatsApp offices, Jan and Brian received a phone call that would change their lives forever. Facebook, who had once rejected the WhatsApp founders job applications, was now making them an offer. They wanted to buy WhatsApp for $19 billion. The founders were absolutely floored by this offer. It was so much more than the company was actually worth, and Mark Zuckerberg even promised to let them run the company independently. It solved all of the startup's problems, with seemingly no downside. Jan and Brian probably knew it was too good to be true at the time, but still, who couldn't resist $19 billion? This life-changing money meant that both the founders would never have to work a day in their lives, their children would never have to work, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. They could do whatever they wanted, with unlimited freedom. And so like anyone would, they sold the company announcing the acquisition in early 2014. But the real question here is, why would Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg spend so much money on WhatsApp? I mean, just a year ago in this time, WhatsApp was valued at $1.5 billion. There's no way it could be worth over 10 times as much in just one year, as the app was still barely making any money at all. People everywhere were speculating, why would Zuckerberg do this? And eventually it seemed like the main reason for this was that WhatsApp's immense growth threatened Facebook's own Messenger app, and their massive data machine told them it was doing Messenger's job better. For example, it had much higher average engagement. People just use WhatsApp a lot more than Messenger. And so with both of the apps under its control, Zuckerberg would then be able to further expand his monopoly. And this wasn't going unnoticed. There were some very real monopoly concerns here, as Zuckerberg was buying up Instagram at the exact same time, which is why both WhatsApp and Facebook were afraid the deal wouldn't make it past Europe's anti-monopoly checks. But when the time for these came, Zuckerberg and Facebook were able to fool the officials by saying that Facebook would never get access to WhatsApp data. This was because WhatsApp's end-to-end -end encryption was ironclad, and people trusted the app because of this. Even WhatsApp couldn't read the messages, and that meant it was incredibly hard to collect any data. And Zuckerberg always assured the founders that he would stick to their values and ideals. He would use their vision for the future of WhatsApp, but always left the details vague. Although these empty promises both convinced the founders and the European Commission, and it wouldn't take long for the deal to successfully go through. However, in hindsight, government officials would call this one of the worst monopoly decisions in history. And in the following years, the founders would come to regret this decision massively. But at the time, everything seemed perfect, and Zuckerberg was going to exploit this of judgment to the fullest. But before we continue, I want to tell you about our video sponsor. You see, in today's media landscape, it's almost impossible to consult a single source or article to get the full picture of what's happening around the world. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about a new app and website I've been using, Ground News. Ground News is a non-partisan media comparison platform that aggregates over 50,000 sources and has become an integral part in finding facts and researching news for videos like this. You see, let's take a look at WhatsApp on Ground News. Here we can see there's 428 stories published on WhatsApp in just the last three months and here we can see all the top stories in recent news. Now let's take a closer look at this article on WhatsApp's challenge against EU Data Protection Board. You see, in 2021, the Irish Data Protection Commission imposed a $225 million fine on WhatsApp, and a few days ago, their challenge against this was dismissed as inadmissible. And by using Ground News, we can see there's nine sources covering this, and that it's being covered slightly more by right-leaning outlets. Scrolling down, we can see all the articles reporting on the story, the factuality rating, and ownership of that source. And it's so helpful to see it visualized this way, where a single word or phrase can alter our understanding of a story. I particularly like that we can filter by factuality and click in to read each article from its original source. And Ground News is on a mission to offer clarity, hold media accountable, and well inform the world by encouraging readers to think freely. I'm really proud to have Ground News as a sponsor, and I highly encourage you to check it out at ground.news forward slash moon to stay fully informed on breaking news around the world, compare coverage, and to know where your news is coming from. So subscribe before December 20th to get 35% off their top subscriptions and unlimited access for as little as $2 a month. Now, whilst Facebook obviously wanted to get rid of the competition, WhatsApp's main draw was its data. And this is the second stage of how WhatsApp makes money through its incredibly unique ability to farm user data. You see, they already had the users. 
WhatsApp was on everyone's phone, and every day more and more people were just downloading the app. It was too big to fool. And so WhatsApp could give Facebook these people's phone numbers, their contact books, and their actual pictures, along with tons more. And it promised this data from all of its hundreds of millions of users. And like I mentioned, WhatsApp was growing every day exponentially. For example, by 2014, WhatsApp now had over 500 million active users. And so with Facebook investing their ludicrous sum to get access to the data of billions of people, all they now had to do was wait. But there were still some major problems with Facebook's plan. And the biggest problem for Facebook? The founders. You see, Zuckerberg had promised them independence, and he had to uphold the agreement, at least for a little while. But within the year, Facebook was already eating away at the founders' ability to uphold their ideals. After the deal had been made, Zuckerberg reportedly told Brian that WhatsApp was just a product group to him. And soon after this, Facebook had brought the first targeted ads to WhatsApp. They snuck them into a new status feature, despite the major pushback from the founders. Next, Zuckerberg moved to dismantling WhatsApp's famous encryption. You see, the app security had been one of the major selling points and was one of the many reasons behind its success. But Facebook couldn't keep this intact. They needed to start siphoning off this data. Managers of Facebook began asking questions about slipping data collection into WhatsApp's algorithms, all whilst avoiding the encryption. And to be fair, the founders did try to fight back for their part, coming up with a new plan where users would only get a certain amount of free messages and pay for messages over the excess. But this was shut down. It just wasn't as valuable or as powerful as data and advertising. And so in 2016, just two years after they bought the company, Facebook announced that they would fully integrate WhatsApp into their data machine. What was once encrypted information, not even known to WhatsApp themselves, was now going straight into Zuckerberg's pockets. This was the last straw. It had barely been two years since they sold the company and WhatsApp was already being used to harvest people's personal data. All of their original core values had been violated. And so when Zuckerberg started bringing up these ideas of adding more business tools, more targeted ads, more data collection, it was all just too much for the founders. So the founders made their plans to leave as WhatsApp had a clause in their contract with Facebook promised that these sorts of monetization tactics wouldn't be allowed on the platform. And so the founders thought that Facebook had clearly broken this agreement. But when they brought it up in negotiations, Facebook had found a loophole, since Zuckerberg had only been exploring monetization rather than implementing it on a wide scale. And Zuckerberg had another trick up his sleeve, because hidden in the contract was a clause that the founders would lose tons of money if they backed out of the company early. However, this just didn't matter by this point. Brian and Yang were so dismayed at Facebook's actions that they chose to leave the company early anyway, causing them to lose $850 million in the process. Now, initially after leaving the company, Brian praised Zuckerberg half-heartedly in a public post, but later on, in an interview, Brian sounded completely different. He was guilty about what happened. Quote, I sold my user's privacy to a larger benefit. I made a choice and a compromise, and I live with that every day. Hian then left six months later, also sick of Facebook's abuse against privacy. But at this point, this was the least of Facebook's problems. In early 2018, Facebook's data harvesting secrets were revealed to the world in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Data from 87 million people had been used in a psychological profiling system, and this had been used to probe for people's weaknesses to targeted advertising and political campaigns. One of employee came forward to say this on the program. We exploited Facebook to harvest millions of people's profiles and built models to exploit what we knew about them and target their inner demons. But unsurprisingly, Facebook was unapologetic. They said that people had handed over their data freely and had consented to this. They even banned the whistleblower from Facebook, Instagram, and even WhatsApp. The world was furious and the controversy led to the famous Senate hearings with Mark Zuckerberg. Brian Acton even told people to delete Facebook just months after thanking them for his journey. But at Facebook, it was all just a bump in the Road, because Mark Zuckerberg was now ready to move on to the third stage of how WhatsApp would make its money by turning WhatsApp's data into an algorithmic goldmine. With the founders out of the picture, Facebook now had free reign over WhatsApp, and Zuckerberg would turn this into his own data harvesting machine. Now, Facebook had already tested their plans to implement business and analytic tools in WhatsApp from as early as 2017, but they were now ready to roll this out to the public. On the surface, it looked like a legitimate way that Facebook could monetize the platform. Businesses could let people place orders and ask questions through WhatsApp, and Facebook would make money by charging for the service. But this program is mostly for show. The hidden detail was that this gave an excuse for Facebook to update their privacy policy for WhatsApp. And hidden in the fine print was the fact that Facebook could access much more data than they could before. There are two screens with a big accept button. There is no option to reject. And this is the tricky part. WhatsApp will let you send messages to businesses, but they won't get the same level of privacy. What does that mean? 
Say you buy something on WhatsApp, pay a bill or complain about a product or service. These messages or exchanges can potentially be monetized. Even before the update, WhatsApp can access things like how long you use the app, your IP and any unique identifiers your system might have. But if you wanted to use the new features, you would be giving Facebook access to transaction and payment information, cookies and even your actual location. Facebook forced this update out in 2021, despite widespread protests at its implications for privacy. And to be fair, people had very big reasons to worry. Facebook had suffered multiple breaches of data ever since the Cambridge Analytica scandal, with the FTC issuing them a $5 billion fine in July. And so you would think that they would be careful. But just a few months later, 267 million people's personal information was found floating around on the dark web. It had been stolen from Facebook, and it included people's names, phone numbers, and Facebook account details. A few months later, 40 million more accounts were uncovered, which also came from Facebook's data banks. This was then followed by other data breaches. 540 million Facebook user records were found on a public server just waiting to be read. But when they weren't losing the data they got from WhatsApp, they were selling it. They sold it to Bing, and then Bing would use this to personalize search results based on people's Facebook information. Facebook would then make deals with companies like Netflix and Spotify to let their algorithms read users' private messages. They then let the Russian search engine Yandex make indexes of people's identities and public profiles in order to personalize their results. And the most egregious of all is that Facebook even let the Chinese tech giant Huawei pull data from their apps while the app was being used on their device. Devices, all going back to the Chinese government. There's a whole slew of other people using this data, from politicians, governments, big business. I mean, Facebook's main revenue comes from advertisers who are desperate to know everything about you. Also that they can monetize this information by making targeted ads more and more specific. Anything they learn allows them to build their profile on you. And the more complete a picture they have of you, the more likely you are to buy whatever they're selling. And all of this information came out in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. However, these are only glimpses of the massive data machine that WhatsApp has facilitated. Which is scary, because WhatsApp is now approaching the 3 billion user mark today, meaning Facebook has access to almost half the world's personal information. And now that they've consolidated their hold over WhatsApp, they're starting to exploit it to the fullest. After implementing the controversial privacy changes, advertisement revenue jumped to its highest ever for Facebook. Across all their platforms, they made nearly $115 billion in 2021. And all of this is possible because of WhatsApp. It gives Facebook access to billions of people. These people then give them data, and then they this fuels Facebook's data machine empire. Although it never seemed like it on the surface, WhatsApp was easily worth the billions that Facebook paid for it. For one, it gave the company a much more secure future. WhatsApp gives Facebook's data machine access to billions of people. And in return for this, Facebook can keep the service as a free alternative, undercutting the competition and ensuring Facebook maintains its monopoly. And even if Facebook itself keeps losing popularity, they'll still always have WhatsApp, their golden goose. And as long as it remains on people's phones, Facebook will always have the fuel for its algorithm rhythmic money-making machine.